Hello and welcome back to the MXGP podcast show on Vital MX, round one of the 2024 FIM Motocross World Championship has been and gone, the Grand Prix of Patagonia, Argentina, and by all accounts, the fabulous track of Villa La, Ag Villa La Angostura has been and gone as well. So we'll get into all of that and more on this episode of the MXGP podcast show. If you are watching on YouTube for the first time ever, hello! Enjoy the podcast and the accents. Please don't tell us that we shouldn't be talking because we have British accents. That's just you not poor fair. People. It's common as well. Um, this MXGP podcast show is brought to you by Polisport, the All Balls Racing Group, and EVS. You can see their logos in the bottom corner if you're watching on YouTube. We, of course, thank them for their support. All Balls Racing Group and EVS are new to the show for this year. Uh, Polisport are with us from last year. So we appreciate and thank them for their commitment to what we are doing here. I'm your host, Lewis Phillips, joined by the much better journalist on this podcast, a winner of multiple awards, book writer, um, MotoGP extraordinaire, Adam Wheeler, and from the Paddock Pass podcast, which was actually the only title you wanted, but I forgot. Lewis, that's the nicest introduction ever. I, I, I don't quite know what to say. In fact, mentioning the Paddock Pass podcast, um, you know, people might be able to, you know, see my background. I'm wearing a fly racing t-shirt and also uh, there's a lid behind me there. That's um, straight from the setup with, uh, you know, the Paddock Pass podcast this this, this morning, actually. So, um, yeah, that's that's where it was sorted. So if people like MotoGP, they can finish this and then go and listen to you there. It's an Adam Wheeler palooza. Yeah, I think the only thing that's different is the light. We recorded that this morning and now we've, we're bathed in sunlight here in Barcelona. Well, remember when we were going to have JT on this podcast? Feels like another lifetime ago. It does. Uh, and then he kind of defected, right? I mean, he was of MX Vice. I think Racer X. I'm not actually sure. Maybe one day we can do like a breakdown of what happened in, in that situation. Well, clearly I've made an effort at branding here, Lewis. But then, you know, what's your excuse? You look like you're in a photo booth. Yep. Uh, I'm being chased by the government. So my don nondescript <laughs> location is by design, uh, giving nothing away. I could be anywhere in the world right now. Um, so that is the, uh, yeah, the inspiration behind what I'm doing here. I should get a clothing sponsor. I was. Well, I mean, you could at least wear a Vital t-shirt. To be honest with you, Adam, I was close to having a clothing sponsor in the off season. And for an amount okay. of money that you would probably be very surprised at. <laughs> well, um, like 50 quid in a couple of tracksuits uh, no a lot more than that but it, all I would have had to done is wear the t-shirt at every race and on every podcast but I um, couldn't I wasn't a good enough agent to get the deal done why so, I mean were you asking too much or uh, too much product I just wasn't I didn't really follow through I wasn't really sure I, I felt a bit uncomfortable because I didn't know like I didn't really feel like that was worth their money but they wanted to well, now you're to on me. YouTube a lot more. I mean, you've got more bar bargaining power. I hope you're going to be suitably and better dressed maybe later in the season. Yeah, I will try. It's only round one. We've got 57 motos to go. So plenty of time to uh, yeah make improvements. So let's start with this. Um, there's no guest this week. We typically will have a rider or team manager on this podcast. The MXGP contingent had a horrific journey back from Patagonia, Argentina. Um, it's long anyway, it's typically a 29 hour travel day, but most of the paddock were caught in a 10 hour delay in Buenos Aires. So um, everyone's really loving life and not feeling in the mood for a podcast right now, which is understandable. Well, it's better than being stuck 10 hours in Bariloche. I mean, that's a bit of a, a nothing airport, but it is a hike. I mean, we may have said this before, perhaps last year on the podcast, but I think the flight from London to um, Buenos Aires is one of the longest that British Airways do. It's like 14 hours. Then you have to cross uh, the capital city, which is no mean feat, fly from the other airport, which is more domestic. And then I think it's another two hour flight to Bariloche uh, and then a good hour and a half drive to the circuit. So it really is a haul. Yeah, um, not to name drop, but I was talking to Chase Sexton at the weekend. And I said, I dropped into the conversation <laughs> something like, yeah, imagine like flying or traveling 31 hours to get to a race. And he was like, what? 
And I was like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's maybe more than that. And could not fathom the idea of that happening. But um, yeah, I think people typically think it's just Argentina, but it's so far from Buenos Aires that it's more chilly than Argentina, isn't it? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, where the track is located, it's in sort of like a ski resort. It's uh, it's a really kind of, I don't want to say deep Patagonia because any Argentinians listening to this will probably laugh and, and mock us straight away on YouTube. But uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a long way to go, right on the Chilean border. And um, as, as much as the track is picturesque, it can also be a little bit gnarly and sketchy. Uh, I was surprised to hear your very favorable description of it uh, at the beginning of the podcast, because I think there was quite a bit of consternation about the state of the track and the speed and some of the the stuff we saw at the first race of this. Well, it is beautiful. Is that the word I used? Fabulous, I think. Oh, was the okay. word I used. meant to say beautiful. So. Right. <laughs> ah, okay. It's fabulous as well. It It's fabulous. It's got the wow factor. It looks incredible. It's one of those tracks that um, everyone goes, oh, I want to race there. And then they do one lap and they go, I really don't want to race there. <laughs> um, <laughs> every year it takes out a lot of riders. Uh, I believe that every single rider I spoke to said, yeah, it was sketchy. I just wanted to get out of there in one piece. Um, so the fact that it has potentially gone away now, I mean, I don't know what you heard, but it seems like it's gone. But we've heard that so many times that it's almost like the boy that cried wolf. I'm not going to believe it until I see it. Yeah, for for quite some time now, since the, the track first appeared, I mean, it's, it's, it's a relatively new build. It wasn't like an age-old track. I think it was built in 2014. The first Grand Prix was run in 2015. Uh, the event itself, you know, has proved to be pretty stable. I mean, we only, MHDP didn't go there for two years because of the pandemic, but otherwise it's been there ever-present. And considering the state of the Argentine economy and how unstable that can be, that's not a bad feat. Uh, 2024 has seen cancellation of MotoGP and World Superbike rounds. And the, the kind of talk was that MXGP was saved by a little bit of negotiations and diplomacy from in front motor racing. And, you know, to be honest, though, it looked like there was a really decent crowd. On Saturday, I was, you know, a little sceptical. But on Sunday, it looked far busier uh, and pretty chilly. I mean, everyone was wrapped up in coats and hats. Yeah, I, I believe that they are looking for a new venue in Patagonia. Uh, I don't know how that will go. I still remember 2015 when the circuit debuted. In the run-up to Patagonia, Argentina, all of the talk was, why are we going all of that way? Another car park track. It's going to be horrific. Why are we going to Argentina? And then the first photo of the circuit emerged and everyone quickly shut up. Um, <laughs> but I fear that whatever the replacement track is is most likely to be a man-made car park track. I mean, maybe not, but the chances of finding another track with that beauty um, in the same region seems unlikely. Yeah, I mean, if we have any Argentina motocross fans watching or listening, then send us a comment. Let us know of any decent tracks in, in the country. You would think the promoters would try to make something near a big city or a big town uh, just to get that sort of local uh, gathering or public, but... You know, because the Argentines are real, real big sort of motorcycle or motorsport fans. So there is there is a flavor for the sport. And of course, in 2015, it was rammed partly because of the Villapodo factor. Uh, but, you know, that that was still the most memorable Grand Prix in that area for me. I, and I struggle to think or, you know, the times I've been back to see a similar kind of response or, or a crowd flocking. But then 2015 was very much the RV hype. So uh, there was uh, a lot of lot of excitement around MXGP at that time. Honestly, the best thing that uh, David Luongo can do is get a track in Buenos Aires, because then I believe you'd attract a lot of American industry and fans. Um, if it's in Buenos Aires, you could potentially have the nations there, maybe. Certainly more likely to have it in Buenos Aires than you are uh, in Patagonia. So if they want to try and bottle the Argentine, Argentine, is it? Argentine market? Argentine? I think so. Yeah. No, yeah. Argentine. Oh, Argentine market and drive it forward um, and use it for other things like the motocross of nations, then that would be their best bet. Uh, but I don't know how possible that is. We did hear, there was a rumor like four years ago that we were going to have a track in Buenos Aires and nothing happened. Similar to all of the rumors about the Patagonia Argentine Grand Prix going away. Nothing happened. Maybe it's an Argentina um, debacle. 
I understand the reason for heading away from Europe because you just want to try and find some weather where you can stage a Grand Prix. Uh, if we think about the British Grand Prix, what, three uh, three years ago, 2020? Yep. Uh, the pandemic year when we had um, like a hurricane blowing over a lot of the structure at Matterley Basin, then, you know, you can be skeptical about running the first round of the championship in European shores because just of, of the winter. But I do think it's too far. Argentina is too far for the first race for such a Eurocentric um, sport with teams, brands, um, fans, everything. It's uh, it's too much of a hike. I think it's a, it's a great Grand Prix. And if it could survive, purely because of the reasons we've said about atmosphere and support, then fantastic. But um, for round one, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, you say Argentina. Do you mean the country as a whole or just Patagonia? Um, I think the country as a whole, but you know, we've only ever been to um, a Grand Prix in that region. Uh, if you compare it to Brazil, that was, you know, had big support from the likes of Honda Brazil. Um, you know, we know the Brazilian motocross championship and the supercross championship is also quite a lucrative and well-supported series, but those Grand Prix were quite different experiments. I mean, for a couple of years we had, um, in, oh goodness, I can't even remember the name, a better Carrero, which was essentially, uh, a temporary build in the car park of a, of a theme park just outside Florianopolis. Um, Canadinha was another one. And we went to Campo Grande, which was a little bit further north, uh, well, quite significantly further north uh, near Paraguay. So the, the the race was kind of, and Trinidad as well, which was closer to Guania, where there's a quite renowned road race circuit. So that the, the Grand Prix was spread around different locations and, and different sort of topographies. And it didn't really settle, but Argentina could have some uh, potential, Lewis. But um, I, yeah, I would be a fan of not seeing round one in Nelkien next year, if possible. Well, I believe that you will get your wish, and you know what, <laughs> viewers and listeners, you too can have your wish of unbreakable levers. Thank you to our sponsors at Polysport. Do you remember all of the crashes and falls that you have had? and the levers that you destroyed because of that? I'm sure you do. Unless you hit your head, then. Maybe not, but I hope you're well. <laughs> well, that's no longer a problem. Polysport released the Pivot Unbreakable Levers, a lever set that never breaks. If you fall, they can be bent back to their original shape, easy as that. Incredible, right? Um, and it is truly incredible. Polysport driving forward with their products and innovation, and we applaud them for that, as well as thank them for their commitment to what we do here. Right. Let's, you liked the concussion part that I added in, didn't you? Yeah, that was uh, quite off the cuff. Yes, thank you. Nicely done. You really made me feel better about myself. Um, right. So let's start with this. I was very excited about Argentina. I don't know if you quite matched my level of excitement, but did round one meet your expectations, whatever they were? Uh, I liked the nerves and the expectation. Um, about, you know, not knowing what on earth is going to happen, who's going to be fast. And, you know, I think there were a couple of surprises in the results sheet. Uh, for me, a little bit Paul's Jonas, not for you, I know. Wow. Um, Jeffrey Hurlings is, you know, top 10 finish, perhaps a little underwhelming, but a, a really smart move, I think, by the Red Bull KTM rider. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the action highlight for me, Lewis, I think was just on the Saturday when the, the MX2 qualification moto went, you know, a bit bananas. And, you know, a part of me kind of thought, well, why are they pushing so hard? And then, of course, you remember it's the second year of having qualification points. So there is actually a point to um, twist in the throttle a bit harder on a Saturday. But, yeah, there was some there was some there was some good things. There was some some good pockets of action, also some controversy as well. And it was just a shame that there were, were a couple of injuries. But, you know, as much as you want to criticize the track and, you know, other potential things, the throttle does work both ways, doesn't it? Yeah, let's let's start with that. Uh, second year of qualification points, a lot of injuries on Saturday, which is, kind of goes hand in hand. If you see an injury on Saturday, people are quick to blame the qualification heat. Um, I don't know. My feelings haven't changed from last year. I'm still not a fan. I believe there are better, to, better solutions to the problem that in front are trying to solve. I believe that this current solution is quite lazy. Um, there's definitely room to think outside the box. But it is what it is. I, I, I mean, they do it in MotoGP, they do it in F1 now. It's kind of sweeping the sports world. I just would, I do believe that there is a better solution for everyone because Gertz dislocated his elbow on Saturday. 
Uh, Van Donick broke his femur. Broke his femur. Uh, Fernandez, I don't think he actually did anything to his ankle, but it was badly bruised and banged up. Um, and Fernandez was in the first turn, so that's only happening because of the qualification heat. Uh, same with Van Donick, and even Gertz was lap one. So all race situations. Um, yeah, it just it's not a great situation, is it? Yeah, it's. I think it's a natural byproduct of extending the calendar. Uh, you know, if promoters want to run twenty plus meetings in a year, then to also feel that they have to add extra value for the buck to people traveling to the circuit by the forms of uh, Saturday entertainment, then you know you're just going to increase the ante for everybody. And you know, last year was a bit of a trial period. I think people were critical of the qualification races with points but they kind of rolled with it. And now you might see a little bit more hard nose feelings, um, especially if a couple more riders are claimed by the system in MotoGP last year, you know, the first Grand Prix uh, was, was pretty dramatic. There were two injuries straight off the bat three, I think um, in Portugal. So that was also, you know, facing a bit of heat, but there is kind of just a general acceptance now that it's part of a Grand Prix weekend. But um, yeah, the growing trend, Lewis, like you say, I'm just curious as to when maybe the pro nationals or supercross are going to discover some way to, I don't know, just entice people into the stadium or the circuit earlier to, to get more value. Everyone in the paddock wants a one day format. Uh, I don't necessarily believe that a one day format is the best idea for the series or the sport, but I... Except for Tim Geiger. Yes, yes, he was very... I, I don't remember what race that was, but the man is very invested in two-day formats. He was almost in tears just at the question <laughs> that they could go away. It was really... um. You asked that question as well, didn't you, from memory? Yeah, I, well, it, it came around the time of the pandemic when the championship was doing its best just to get through a very difficult set of circumstances to even have a championship. And the one-day format was a consequence and the riders seemed to like it and others were a bit like, oh, actually, I prefer, you know, getting my arm pump out the way and having another, you know, another opportunity on the Saturday. But, um, yeah, there, there is, I, I think the you have to gauge the younger generation. You know, how do they feel about it? Because they're the ones that are going to be racing it in three or four or five years' time. And, then, and by then, it just could be a part of the, the landscape. Yeah, it will reach a moment where it's second nature and we know no different, but that will take some time. Um, speaking of second nature, it became second nature to see Jorge Prado win a qualification heat, which he didn't do in Patagonia, Argentina, but what he did do was win the Grand Prix. He won just two last year, so this was certainly a statement right out of the gate, a warning shot to his competitors, and call me crazy, but I honestly believe that was the best Jorge Prado that I have that I, that I have ever seen MX2 or MXGP. I believe that that was wow. a new level from him. Really? Uh, no. Now you've made me question it. No, I'd like <laughs> to backtrack. And do you not think so? And I, no, I've. I mean, I've seen some Grand Prix in MX2 where I thought this guy is the fastest and best 250 rider I've maybe ever seen. And so it's hard to raid the memory banks and say that's the best I've ever seen Jorge Prado. But I mean, it was a great performance, Lewis. But then I kind of tipped him to be a winner of this Grand Prix simply because of the preseason he's had. I mean, I think not only the the skill development of racing Supercross, but also the whole mental side of it around being um, satisfied that he can cut the mustard to a degree, that it's the direction he wants to take. Uh, it means he's kind of settled in the future of his career and where he wants to go. I think all that stuff has, you know, some some real weight behind it. And um, Prado went into, after you know, everyone else had maybe a bit of a bitty preseason, but Prado, Prado was on, on the source, you know? What on earth is a bitty preseason? Isn't that from Little Britain? But no, it means it's... Uh, I don't know, sporadic, okay. infrequent. I mean, there was some, there was some meeting. I mean, wasn't it um, Valence or what, which French international was cancelled uh, because La of Capelle. the weather? La Capelle, thank you, Valence. I, I don't even sure that circuit exists anymore. Uh, so there are, there were sort of a few interruptions and people. I mean, people getting injured as well. Liam Evans, of course, wasn't in Argentina, but Prado just had a, a strong preseason, a different preseason, but a strong one. Yeah, and I believe that that was evident in his riding. Um, a few riders reached out to me and said that on the track at the same time, they saw more aggression from him. They saw him rub elbows a little more than he has in the past. They saw him run a rider run 
a rider wider than he has in the past. Um, and I believe that we expected Supercross to uh, kind of carry over to MXGP in that way for him. Another little Prado uh, tidbit that was running rampant through the paddock is that his Kawasaki deal in America is not signed in any way because KTM or Austria have an option on him for next year. I had many texts saying it's not signed, this is what I heard, but I spoke to Prado a few weeks ago and he told me categorically there is no option or any tie to Austria because that was this year. The option that was, the reason he's riding for Gas Gas this year is because Austria exercised their option at the end of last year. So I don't know about that, but just, yeah, um, that seemed to be the most popular talking point from the paddock for whatever reason. Mm, the plot thickens. I mean, in 2021, he signed a new deal, but we don't know how many kind of extension points there were on that. But like you say, the activation was done for 2024. So you would assume that that's the end of it. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, nothing's really going to be said until uh, either... Pure Mobility Group are ready to say thank you, Jorge, goodbye, good luck. And his new employer wants to put out a press release saying this is the situation, which could maybe happen at the end of the Supercross season if it's principally a Supercross deal for 2025. Well, don't get me started, but Kawasaki in America are not the greatest at public relations. Um, <laughs> their rider got injured at round before round two, and we're still none the wiser where he is. He may be on trial for murder. Um, we don't know. No one knows. In fact, he's not on trial for murder because it's been like two months. So presumably he went down for it. Terrible. Um, I have a question, Lewis. Do you think Prado, uh, like in previous years in Argentina, pretty much kind of fell into this victory? I mean, Fernandez went 5-1, I think, last year to take the overall win his first in the MHGP class. And, you know, if you look at the, the race, both races, then Geisha was clearly... The man on it i mean a couple of crashes in the first moto i was thinking okay this is typical tim where he mixes brilliance with just a couple of very sort of basic mistakes uh but it should perhaps have been the second hrc win in a row see no i disagree this is what i said about prado off the top and the reason i felt that way i felt like this was a convincing uh win with conviction statement ride like this felt like Pr i feel like prado has backed into gp wins in the past this felt like almost the dawn of a new era where he was you know stepping up and saying no i am the man um okay although if you want to argue against me in the qualifying race he kind of finished where he started so maybe that was proof that that was going to happen no matter what. He was just going to finish where he started on Sunday. Um, maybe if he'd started fifth, it wouldn't be as bright and exciting of a, of a result. Yeah, uh, perhaps. Like you say, and his starts are always going to be one of the strongest um, parts of his canon. So, uh, you know, on a track like that where it's so high speed, um, were you a bit disappointed it didn't rough up a bit more? I mean, if you look at the, the circuit, perhaps for people watching on TV, it's a little bit difficult to explain because it looks sandy, but it's actually kind of these thick granules. It's sort of made of volcanic earth, so it's not quite as soft as, say, a place like in the Benelux region. And underneath, it's quite hard, so it can be very slippery. I mean, riders can't really tuck into that sort of sand pose or sand setting so much uh, because there is a lot of knuckles and hard edges and, and things to negotiate. So it's a, it's a really tricky track, and you have to be very measured uh, otherwise you just you know you're going to come to a big wreck yeah through all the years that you, through all the years that we've been there i almost wish that we'd had more interchangeable interchangeable conditions um, i don't know why i can't speak today um because i was watching the race with max anstey and i said to him i feel as though you could go to argentina today and use the same lines that you used in 2019 and they would be there in exactly the same way for whatever reason it always seems to become exactly the same racetrack and i don't know why that is um maybe because the dirt is a certain way like we said um underneath the volcanic ash on top it is quite hard and firm so maybe that limits the amount of options that develop for riders once they hit that base you have the same sort of racetrack i don't know but it does not boring that's not the word but it does almost feel like You've seen this before when you tune in to watch. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, certainly. And I also think the top three was pretty much what we expected, right? I mean, you had Prado, Febra, Roman Febra as well. Good solid starts of the season for him going 2-3. And then Geyser third on the podium. I don't think that would have been such a wild prediction um, pre-race. Can I just point out that I did predict Prado and Kaida Wolf to win uh, in Argentina? So does that make me 2-0? I don't to remember this. I don't remember you predicting Kaida Wolf to win in Argentina. Yeah, just go and read gategrop.com. Oh, is that where... Okay, so there. it wasn't on this podcast. That's why I don't remember no, it. It has to be on black and white, Lewis. Okay. You know, well, that's, that explains English. why I don't remember it. Um, <laughs> no, I'm not going to get into it too much, but from the preview podcast, I pretty much nailed everything that I said. Um, I'm pretty sure I'm 100% right. So we'll get to Paul Jonas. the guy in fourth position, yeah. We'll get there. Okay. Um, so, yeah, you picked Prado to win a championship. What you saw in Argentina, you're now ready to double down on that, I would imagine. Yeah, I'll keep... My, I'm not ready to change at all. Okay. I um, Neither am I. So, we're at a stalemate. Fevra was... Is it insane to say that Fevra was maybe not the biggest surprise, but certainly better than I expected? Like... I don't know, Fevre could have won. Fevre may have been the best rider in Argentina, and he could have won if the situation had broke differently. And I do not feel like that is always the case with Fevre. So, positive? No? Yes. Uh, pretty much a carryover from last year as well in terms of former results. I think this is also a way to announce himself as being in championship contention too, because that, as we said, it was a track in which he could make a lot of mistakes. And uh, to take those results was um, a pretty solid start. I um. I noticed that he said that he's been sort of uh, messing around with his program a little bit lately and trying to figure out what works exactly. Um, and he now believes he's found a sweet spot, but that sounds like it happened in the weeks leading up to Argentina. So I need to do some digging on this as to what exactly he was changing so late in the day. Um, but I did have to laugh that all through last year, we missed Jeffrey, we missed Tim, and then we started this year with a result with a one-two result that effectively meant Tim and Jeffrey could have continued to be missing. Um, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I mean, Tim won the second race. I mean, yeah, and uh... rattling on, did you see Garibaldi's Instagram post? No, what did he say? I, I mean, I don't have it in front of me. I can try and pull it up, but basically it was the... Or paraphrase. It was a, essentially the Tim Geyser that I saw in Argentina was the best Tim Geyser I've ever seen on a dirt bike. Oh, wow. Yeah, I felt... And I, mean, I messaged that to Roger Harvey, HRC general manager, and said, uh, wow. And Roger kind of gave a much more settled, uh, I know he's happy with a bike and Tim's very comfortable in his situation, not willing to push the boat out like Giacomo did. Um, but yeah, like, Tim's been phenomenal over the years. I feel like... I, I don't know if he'll ever reach that level again. There's been times where Tim's just been um, jaw-droppingly good. So yeah, I felt like that was... Almost an exaggeration. Yeah, maybe just some Italian exuberance on that post. But, you know, I mean, you can excuse the HRC guys for getting a bit carried away. I mean, 2023 wasn't a strong year for him. Or was it a shot across the bow or bow? Um, and was it his way of kind of, you know, sending a message out there that my guy's strong, my guy's feeling it, just you wait, this is ours. No, I, I, I would argue that it's business as usual. Um, is Geyser also in a contract year? We don't know, because HRC always, always, always say multi-year deal, and they will never tell you when that ends. But, not to get too off topic, Prado is likely leaving. Um, Hurlings will retire at the end of next year. Would you be surprised if Austria make Tim an offer? I wouldn't. I... Not not, yeah, not good signs him because maybe he doesn't take the offer, but could you see them expressing their interest? Yeah, I mean, I think there might be a conversation. They might have to. What other options or, are there? Yeah, or if Tim and his management team are smart, then they'll do it at least to get the price up. Uh, but, you know, guys, you're what is still 20, 26, 27? I mean, that's, that's not old. And you have... But then KTM do like to kind of groom their own riders okay i mean they've got andrea damo they've got liam everts uh who knows what's going to happen with the kunan brothers uh there's also riders within the peer and mobility group family so what happens to the likes of simon lagenfelder that Whoa. they believe in him for a 450 
uh, you know, also the Wolf. I mean, there's there's various options. Of course, signing Geiger is like signing a marquee player. And that, that could be, and in the past, I think KTM did that to satisfy the needs of various markets. But yeah, it's, yeah, God, it's a good question, Lewis. But um, I guess it depends on budget. I, I don't, I can't see it happening. Yeah, I did also say that to Roger Harvey, by the way, just so. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I could just like, because I was thinking about it and there aren't many options for the next four years. There are options for the next eight years. But short term, once Prado and Hurlings leave, there's going to be a gap to fill. And Tim's age means that he could fill that perfectly. Um, and I know that Tim's agent is a lawyer who loves money and loves to just like chase money. So I wouldn't be surprised if he knocks on doors. That's if his contract is even up. We'll never know because uh, HRC operate that way. So moving on to the favorite, the most highlighted, the most excitable part of the podcast, Paul's Jonas finished fourth but let's be honest fourth place on paper he had the speed to win he could have quite easily won that grand prix which is a nice change from years gone by so the floor is yours it's uh well, thank you very much um no it's fantastic to see paul's back to form but to uh, health looking fast i think we do have to mention the caveat that it's a very good track for him uh you know arguably it's the scene of the the last Grand Prix he dominated in the MX2 class. You know, he rode phenomenally that day in 2018, uh, beating Hunter Lawrence. So, yeah, there are great starts to the season for Pauls, and I hope he sort of absorbs every granule of confidence um, from, from this result. But uh, he just the, the biggest battle with him is going to be against himself and his own tendency to push because he has to keep healthy, he has to keep at the races. What I hope for Pauls is that Argentina helped him find comfort and it kind of justified himself to himself if you get what I'm saying like he left Argentina going okay I've still got it um I can still do it I don't need to override I don't need to push the limit because what I have and my skill set that I possess is more than good enough to do the job because I do believe that where he's gotten himself in trouble in the past is overriding um being trying too hard almost maybe trying to make up for a weakness that doesn't even exist but he believes exists so if he can yeah take comfort from this and like just use this to carry him forward i see no reason why he's not a regular podium guy and you know what while i'm on my soapbox i picked jonas as my surprise um in the preview I saw somewhere that someone said I had to turn the podcast off after Jonas, uh, after Lewis picked <laughs> Jonas as a surprise. It's so obvious he's just trying to pick a friend. But Jonas is a former world champion. It's quite, it's smart money to say that the former world champion, who's still got seven, six, five years left of his career, is going to come around at some point rather than betting on Ferrato. By the way, we had a good laugh in the press box in Alabama at you saying that Ferrato could win a race this year. Um, so Why? Why is that beyond, you know, the craziness? Well, I mean, you all... laughed at me for the same thing with Fernandez last year and he did it <laughs> the first time. Well, we all yucked. We were laughing away in the press box. Laughing, laughing, laughing. Well, that shows how much you and your cronies know, doesn't it? Okay, well. I think, you know, Paul's is, um, Lewis, I, mean, I think you're right. You cannot write off Paul's because he's on the way back. But then, you know, there, I think there are also a lot of question marks around him and people can point a finger and say, you know, he's uh, he's missed the boat. He's uh, he's maybe passed it. He can't keep fit. I mean, that's one sort of expectation he's going to have to deliver on this year and prove that he can go through the championship. Another mitigating factor is that this is his second year on the Honda. He didn't have that much time last year to get settled with it, to develop it, to make it really his own. Uh, as we saw with the likes of Brian Bogers, you know, that that transition period can be pretty tricky. So I think if Paul's is feeling comfortable on the bike and he's in good shape, then, you know, he is easily a podium guy. I mean, he was rookie of the year in his first MHGP season. But um, like a couple of other people in the MHGP pack, say like Calvin Philandrum being one of them where we said he has to survive, he has to make it to the checkered flag, and he did so in the last sort of season and a half, then, um, yeah, why not? I don't think you can write Jonas off. Uh, like you say, the pedigree is there, but uh, he he has something to prove as well. Yeah, and part of the reason why I doubled down this year with him is I know that they were late getting parts for the Honda last year, switching over from Husqvarna. Uh, Argentina last year, they had bike issues, which weren't obvious 
unless you knew, but that like really held um, pulls back and affected confidence a little bit, maybe. And all of those have been fixed now. All of the gremlins that come from the teething issues that come from joining a new manufacturer have been worked through. So yeah, it was just a smart bet. And maybe he doesn't perform as well in Spain into Xanadu, which is round two. But I would bet he's still top six. He's still right in the picture. It's not like he's now going to go and finish 17th of the next 15 rounds. Well, in the context of Argentina, I thought fourth overall was a good result. And, you know, it's not maybe something I would have forecast beforehand. But I'll put it to you that by finishing fourth, Paul's was probably the last one who uh, overperformed. Because if you look at the riders behind him, they could probably say, yeah, we're happy we came away from this track and these conditions with these points, but also might be a little bit perhaps disappointed. Maxim Renault was fifth. Jeremy Sewer on his Kawasaki debut was sixth. You had Glenn Koldenhoff on the Fantic, his first race right behind him, and then Jeffrey Hellings, which we'll talk about in a moment. And then Calvin Valandri in his first Grand Prix as a, a factory Yamaha rider in ninth. I mean, you get down to 10th with Kevin Hogmo. I think that's his debut in the class, in the Premier class. I mean, that's that was not a bad finish either. But there's a couple of riders there that might be thinking, hmm, uh, maybe expected a bit more from this first race. Yeah, that's honestly, um, that's great analysis. And my little brain would never have even gone down that path um and it's now made me rethink everything about argentina um no it is true um it, that is actually true yeah you could say that the top four riders were the only ones who could come away and say that was my best or at least in the remit of my best um yeah well done analysis you get the analysis of the podcast award um thank you very much you get but do you think Ramon, do you think renault is disappointed with fifth Honestly, I have concerns about Renault. The foot injury that he had last year was similar to Jeffrey's. We know, and Jeffrey's very outspoken about, it's never the same, I'm never going to be the same, the foot was terrible, blah, blah, blah. Renault had issues with it in the run-up to Argentina, like in February, like that late. Um, and I believe those issues will be ongoing. I believe there will be good days, there will be bad days. So I don't know. I believe that it was a fine showing is it fair to say that fifth on paper but not the fifth best rider on a day yeah i think it's a situation where because of the injury he's going to take that top five you know he wasn't uh, he wasn't drastically slow i mean it was a four what four six he finished i mean that's that's a reasonable that's a solid way i mean let's let's throw the cliche at it right it's a solid way to start the season I mean, perhaps Jeremy Sewer with a 7-5 uh, following in 6 could think, well, same thing. Solid, my first Kawasaki ride. Uh, you know, as we mentioned, a, a brutal track where things could go desperately wrong. Uh, top 6, okay. Again, Glenn Koldenhoff is pretty much filling his position there in, in sort of mid-top 10 where he could suddenly explode and finish top 3 or he could drift back out to 11 or 12. Uh, and then we get to Jeffrey Hurlings. Yeah, this is you've played with my mind here. Um I'm I'm kind of in a deep dark place thinking about all of this now, all of a sudden. Well talk um, about hurlings because that was you know, that prompted most talk post race, didn't it? It was like, oh, is he done? Is he finished? I mean, it's crazy talk because again, the the the, the factors you have to take into account are fifty seven more motos to come. He hasn't raced for, what, nine months. Uh, his last appearance was at the Grand Prix of Germany when he crashed and sustained that neck fracture. Uh, you know, okay, looks he, pretty, he looked pretty good in preseason. He looked phenomenal around Lirop, but that's pretty much to be taken, you know, for granted because of the sand. Uh, he also rode in the sand at Hawkstone Park. Uh, you know, I think I thought this was a pretty mature display from Hurlings. I mean, his comments after the race were, oh, I'm already a lot of points behind. But um, I, I didn't really know what to make of that. I thought I was a bit disappointed. I thought, Jeffrey, you don't need to be looking at the points right now, purely because of the amount of points that are left there to win. Uh, that's funny because the comments I got after the race were the complete opposite. So <laughs> who knows? Uh, um, who knows how he truly feels? Uh, yeah, it was... Look, the crux of the situation... Well, first of all, going back, you say his last appearance was Germany. Remember, he did come back for two races and then break his collarbone? Ah, his collarbone, yeah. And then remember, he did come back after the season and race a beach race where he broke or fractured or bent or something did hurt his collarbone so since his last uh 
like since his last what do you Grand call Prix. it? Well, no, not since his last Grand Prix, but since Germany when he was in full flow, it's been stop and start with multiple different injuries. So if you want to be negative, then yeah, you can point to that. But my stance on it is obviously it was going to take time. Obviously he was going to work his way up. Um, similar to last year, like honestly, I believe that a lot of the criticism is coming from the fact that people are comparing this year to Argentina last year where he was second overall. But I do not believe that he should have been second overall last year. I believe he lucked in, or not lucked into it, but I don't think he expected it. I think it came too soon. And maybe making that comparison is confusing people because I do believe that last year, actually, riding-wise, not too different to this year. Um, let's not overlook the fact that Monticelli nearly killed the poor man on Saturday. <laughs> um, if that had gone any worse, Hurlings would have turned to dust. This would be a very different yeah. podcast. Um, he had the withering Jeffrey Hurlings head shake, which is not what you want. Like, And they did touch in the air. I don't know if you can make that out from TV, but Monticelli clipped Hurlings' front wheel. So I do honestly believe that took the wind out of his sails a little bit. And I do believe that he took stock of the situation on Saturday night, noted how many injuries there were, and for lack of a better term, I think it kind of spooked him a little bit. I think it was like, okay, let's get out of here. Because, and I have a theory, um, Hurlings has had great moments in Argentina, but I wouldn't say it's a Hurlings track. True? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree. I mean, yeah. Hurlings has had great moments at every track. So um, that goes without saying almost. And even Sua, never quite great in Argentina. Those are those are riders who are very aggressive, very active on the bike, hard charging. Um, and I believe that maybe that's where the deceiving layout of Pater, of uh, Villa La Angostura is um, maybe harder for them to read or get their head around. And that's why you see performances like this from both of them here, uh, if you can catch my drift yeah yeah I, yeah i don't think you're wrong I, I just think the hurlings overall is too um too experienced and too good to be that overawed by what's going on and i think you know we have to keep a, a maybe a chart or a closer look on his progress in the next grand prix because if he's still taking eight ninth positions by around three four or five then there's there's good cause to be asking questions of him but the, there's the, like we said, Lewis, is there's still so much, so much racing ahead. I mean, it'd be what's the point in leading the championship and setting records by round eight and then disappearing for the rest of the season? I reckon Jeffrey's, you know, he must be going crazy trying to think of approaches to the year and what he has to do. Uh, you know, what's right and what's wrong? How much do you push and how much do you hold back? Uh, the only thing is, I hope he's not caving in too much to the thought of injury or the fear of it because that one might also cause him to shut off the throttle a little and if he's not good enough with his starts then he is going to be distant in the fight this year i believe that he has pegged uh mid-april as the time like that's when you'll see jeffrey hurlings um i don't know if i necessarily agree with that because spain uh, into xanadu has been a great track for him uh Weirdly, I wouldn't put that down as a hurlings track, but he won there last year. He won there in 2021, uh, didn't race 2022. Um, so in my mind, I expect him to be in the top five battling for a podium there. And then a week later in Sardinia, I expect him to win or at the very least uh, be battling for the win. If he follows that roadmap, there's no reason to doubt him because that's it. There's your upward uh, trajectory. There's your... Um, building blocks that's almost yeah what he should be doing so it's way too early to cast judgment and it's he's kind of fortunate that you know one of the heaviest soundtracks on the calendar is coming up early uh so that should be a, a you know a way for him to really sort of throw down the gauntlet and say okay i'm taking my next win my 104th and um, i'm going to be right in it for the for the championship and get some points back um just to circle back with some notes i have heard that Yamaha are struggling somewhat with the 2024 YZ450F. Um, just from a few different sources, I believe that there is some searching going on uh, with those riders. So just relevant to Renault, uh, relevant to Sua, um, that was his best ride in Argentina, his best result. So although he is in an 
in a state with a Kawasaki where he is always moving forward and finding solutions and advantages that can um, aid him in his quest for a world title. I believe that was a solid start. I understand why some people would look at that and be disappointed, but again, make for comparison to years gone by. And you know what, actually? Um, I stumbled onto this the other day, and I'm going to tell you about it now quickly because it almost confused me somewhat. Um, Sua. In his uh, six years as a 450 rider, has finished on the podium across the first three rounds once. Really? So well, he's a terrible starter. We, I think we knew that he doesn't start seasons well, but did we know it was that bad? <laughs> no, but it was a chronic issue a couple of years ago and something he wanted to address. And I think it might have actually been in his last year in MX2 where he suddenly ripped off a series of podiums. I mean, Koldenoff was the same. Up until the f he broke his knee ligaments, uh, I want to say it was 2014 uh, when he was riding the factory Suzuki. And Koldenoff was the same, was a rider that just was a bit slow to start, but then, you know, got trophies in the bag. And then before he was injured, it was was pretty much a, a podium or a title contender. So, but um, yeah, pretty good stat on Sua. Like you say, maybe he should come away happier with a six. And there's every chance that, you know, round two in Spain, the weather could be a little bit unpredictable at this time of year. Uh, let's see what he can do. Um, also, congratulations to Jeremy Sewer on his 184th MXGP round in a row. Um, give the man a vacation. I'm sure that violates some <laughs> sort of labor law or something. Um, do they not have mandatory days off in Switzerland? Uh, goodness, but you know, he should def he should definitely have a bonus, I think, on consecutive races. I mean, if he hasn't got that written into his contract, then he's missed a trick. Um, like it's it's actually phenomenal to think, and we still you looked into this on a podcast last year. I don't know if we've got a definitive answer of how many races Joel Smets did in a row. No, so it's still a bit of a mystery. But he believes that Jeremy is is way ahead. Well, you just would think so. Of races. Like, how yeah. can Joel be ahead of one hundred and eighty four? <laughs> Yeah. In in fact, this um, I don't know what the result of this stat will be. So Sua has done 184 rounds in a row. Hurlings has started 175 in his career. So Sua has done more races in a row than Jeffrey has in his entire career. Uh, I believe that is some sort of statement. Uh, moving on. Quickly. Don't forget Smets also, I think for three seasons, only raced a one moto format. Yes, so you can't count it. Uh, the second you enter the one moto format into a conversation, I write it off as a separate conversation. Um, before we move on to MX2, and stay tuned because we will get into the Stark uh, electric class debacle at the end of the podcast, so stay tuned to that. Uh, before we move on, though, Vlandering um, had a crash in late January, early February, so he's not quite 100% yet. Um, not got an injury or anything, but he's still building. So actually, between Renault, Gertz, and Vlandering, Factory Yamaha as a whole are in just a kind of building phase. Um, so just bear that in mind moving forward. And you, I feel like you downplayed Kevin Horgmo's 450 debut. That's, Kevin Horgmo is a little man, and he didn't <laughs> exactly have the most decorated MX2 career. I don't know if anyone ever would have suspected that Kevin Horgmo would start with a top 10. That's um, phenomenal in my mind. Well, that, if he's a little man, then don't place him next to Alberto Ferrato then. Well, can um, you imagine those two in a first-term pile-up? <laughs> who incidentally wasn't racing because um, he sustained a hematoma, a really bad dead leg, um, you know, in the preseason race in Lear Up that we mentioned earlier that Hurlings won, uh, tried to ride in Argentina but couldn't do it. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to downplay it at all. I mean, it's a good achievement to get a top 10, especially in the first Grand Prix of the year where most of the people are fit. But then maybe it could be one of those weirdo first round results. Um, but, you know, I, you have to give credit to the Norwegian uh, top 10 in the second moto, um, just like Ben Watson taking a top 10 in the first moto. Um, if you're new to this podcast and you are trying to get into MXGP, we should do a better job of trying to like give you little tips and tricks. So... If that is you, Kevin Horgmo does vlogs every week uh, and they are quite good. So if you're looking for like uh, content that helps you get to know a rider, give you a rider to cheer for, maybe Kevin Horgmo's your guy. I'll try and drop 
remember to like tell you stuff like that in the future if you're new. Um, ben Watson, yes, Adam. Well, don't skip over Valentin Guillo. Yeah, yeah. Well done to Valentin Guillo as well. Yep, well done. Um, ben <laughs> Watson. So we passed. Oh, sorry, he passed uh, Jeffrey Hurlings in the second moto and guided Jeffrey Hurlings through the pack. Just Hurlings just knew that he had to follow the 919 for the fast way around Villa La... I can't actually say it without pausing. Villa La Angostura. Um, so that's phenomenal. Uh, Can you say it? Um, Via La Angostura. Is that, is, that, is that how it's meant to be said? Yeah, because V in Spanish is pronounced like a B. Well, why have you waited this long to tell me? <laughs> well, I, I just enjoy you trying to say it, that's all. So Via. Via La Angostura. Like like <laughs> um, just say Nelkian. Nikian. Nelkian. Nelquin. Whatever. Okay, I can't, I don't, I think I've got an issue. Um, Valentin Gio was 11th overall and Ben Watson was 12th, ahead of Ivo Monticelli, resuming villainous um, status in 13th. But do, you do realise how good this was for Ben Watson, right? That was a good start. Again, I would file it under a solid start. 12th overall, uh, top 10 in the first moto. Um, the fact that he had he was sharing track with Jeffrey doesn't really mean much at all. He also I think he'll just be happy off. to get points. Um, no, I look at it as positive because I do not believe that Argentina is a Ben Watson track. Uh, very fast. He's much better in slower, more technical situations. I do not believe that it is a beta track or beta, depending on where you're listening to this. Because again, fast and power is the issue with the beta or beta. Um, so for him to come out with a top 10, yeah, I see. That makes me wonder what's going to happen when um, we get to like the deep sand of Rio Lozado. And you know what? That makes me wonder what's going to happen when we get to silly season. Because maybe, just maybe, um, some other teams start to wisen up to what Lewis has been saying all along. <laughs> perhaps <laughs> no it was, was a good was a good race by ben second year on that bike and you know just ahead of his teammate um, monticelli but um one more observation perhaps a little bit on on the mhgp overall lewis uh if you look i'm just looking at the standings now jan pansar 14th ahead of isaac gifting making his debut in the category for sweden um there's a little group there as well uh cornelius tundo tundo if i said that correctly and kevin bruman um, who don't forget? I think uh, this round last year was where in the uh, onboard lap um, video or demonstration. Uh, you know, there's a little group of riders that could be, you know, looking to move up to the next sort of tier. I need to vent. So, oh, no. to our disappointment and our dismay, the MXGP TV broadcast started, and we had all the same old shebang. It's the first MXGP moto of the year. I am wetting myself with excitement <laughs> who do we interview on the start line kevin fucking Bruman. honestly well, i i i don't even remember who i was with because i blacked out but i started like screaming like see 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 who who is the editorial mind behind this who's sat there going we could we could ask jeffrey about you know, coming back from injury again. We could talk to Prado about Supercross. No one's heard from Kevin Bruman in a while. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the reason for it. Like, I mean, he's a man across the nations. I, I, almost turned, I almost turned MXGP off. That killed my excitement. Listen, on another thing, um, you said everything was the same. But did you see the strange kind of VIP start um, platform that's next to the gate? That's been there all along. That? What do you mean it's been all along? That's been there for a lot of... That's new. I feel like I've seen that every year. No. It was like a special platform that's right next to the gate and it yeah. was hugely it's branded. It's just an Argentina thing. Like it's for the, it's from the Argenti Argentine promoter, I believe. So they're not going to run it in any other races? I then? don't believe it. Well, unless it's... Unless in front have taken the idea from Argentina in years past. Um, no. But also on that note... Um, you know how normally they have a practice start area in the paddock? Which is just chaos yeah. and ridiculous. Uh, that's been banned. Oh, all right. Okay. So, it was usually behind the gate, right, wasn't it? Uh, in Argentina, yeah. But like in Lockett, it's in the car park. Uh, in Majora, it's next to the restaurant. Like, um, it's always in, in Matterley Basin. It's in a cornfield. Um, yeah. They, that's been banned. So now on Fridays, there's like a 30-minute practice start 
session on the Sart Strait. Um, there's flags for it and everything. So full like the budget has gone all out on the promotional aspect. Um, yeah, <laughs> so that's that. Um, by the way, we uh, go on. Uh, I am in contact with David Luongo, my friend, and we will be sitting down this weekend. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm sure you'll get some information on the US venue of the Motocross of Nations in 2025. No, I'm going to sit down with him and say, David, I didn't want to hear from Kevin Bruman. I'm sorry. He was literally (laughs) the last person that I wanted to hear from at this point in time. Yeah, but maybe, you know, I mean, it was lovely for Kevin's family and all of his sponsors, and there was something going on with <laughs> Kevin's grand was over the moon. moon. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, while I'm while I'm ranting and getting stuff off my chest, on Friday, there was an Instagram video on MXGP with Jeremy Sewer. And you may be wondering, what's the editorial angle for this? New team? We hear that you've had some struggles with a Kawasaki, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Guess what the interview started with? Go on. You were just telling me about what you were like as a baby. <laughs> Honestly, Adam, I'm, I'm at the end of my tether. It's like they decided to say, you know what, it's round one. Let's just push Lewis to the edge already. Let's just see what we yeah. can do. But isn't that just part of the whole crappy new TikTok generation? You know, we need to know about your favorite pair of trainers kind of thing rather than, you know, how was your sporting career and what status and phase is in at the moment? Also, I really, <laughs> you've really got me started. Um, I need to talk to David because I like a lot of Supercross riders said to me, could you get me a free code to MXGP TV? I want to watch it. And I was like, no, <laughs> but I should be able to because in front should understand that I can actually help with like the American promotion. For instance... Uh, you don't have a code to watch the races? I do, but I can't get one for other people. Oh. Oh, okay. I think I'm lucky yeah, to have yeah. one myself. Um like Supercross give me codes for their video pass to give to MXGP riders. Oh, okay. You may have seen Ben Watson do a fabulous story thanking Supercross for his video pass. Um, no, I didn't. I missed no. that one. Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Don't tell Feld. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, no, but I feel like MXGP should do the same in reverse. Like me and David have a lot to get on. I mean, me and David, I'm going to have to have an agenda for this meeting. Well, make sure you schedule the meeting. Well, it's you actually, know, I just said it would be good to catch up. Little does he know we are. <laughs> He's going to get battered. I'm going to get in a, I'm going to get in one of those classic downtown, downtown American elevators with him where there's like 32 <laughs> floors and I'm going to push every button and be like, right. <laughs> so now we have some time. <laughs> He'll be um, doing like a, a speed escape through the hatch in the top. <laughs> yeah. Bruce Willis. Um, can I make can I make a mention, a special mention in the um, MHGP standings for in 24th? No, sorry. 23rd overall. You have Sergio Ignacio Bilaronga Muga, who took the very last Grand Prix point to finish 23rd. And I think he was one of, what, 12 to 13 uh, local riders from various countries in South America to take part. So well done, uh, Sergio. Um, One more. (laughs) You should have got me to say that. That would have been great. Um, One more tip from MXGP. Uh, Lars Van Berkel, who uh american fans got to know from his appearance in the outdoors last year he kind of appears everywhere i'm not really sure what he's doing with his life um but he raced um and he scored points so well done lars van berkel right before we get on to mx2 let me tell you about all balls racing group the all balls racing group is a combination of the finest aftermarket power sports brands from across the us and europe Combining OEM-level engineering and design capabilities with a world-class supply chain makes them the largest global supplier of critical aftermarket hard parts for the power sports industry. You can trust the All Balls Racing Group to provide the exact fitment and best quality in the industry at a price that fits your budget. So thank you to the All Balls Racing Group. You can see their logo at the bottom of this screen. Um, And... Um, if I'm struggling to talk and a bit out of sorts, it's because I've got a video system in front of me which resembles NASA. Um, I could probably launch a <laughs> rocket from this. So it's really... You're very nicely lit, I have to say. Um, uh, it's because I've got like an old-fashioned English lantern. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Yes. I mean, that's that's very kind of Dickensian. I mean, you're going to be wandering around, you know, with a, a little hat on and a, and a cane as well. Uh, yes, I am. And who are you to say... <laughs> who are you to diss me for that um right kaida wolf uh, apparently your pick to win um certainly not mine 
the most encouraging part of his showing. Uh, he was measured. He had patience. He took advantage of others' mistakes. That is not Kaida Wolf. But if that is the new Kaida Wolf, we may have a title contender on our hands. And yeah, Simon Lagenfelder definitely has a, a rival. Because these two riders are not renowned for their consistency and excellence, are they? I mean, they will blaze hot one minute and then be rather mediocre the next or crash and get injured. So, Kai, I hope you've taken a lot from that. Um, congratulations to the whole Husqvarna team. Uh, Rasmus Jorgensen, our friend as well. And, you know, go all that way and take a decent win. So don't get injured. Um, it was Lucas Coonan who essentially gifted Kai the Grand Prix win. Uh, Coonan crashed two corners from the end on the last lap of Moto2. Uh, gave me flashbacks to Sun City 2005. Um, when Everts pointed to the crowd on the last lap and crashed. Um, and as a Josh Coppins fan, I leapt for joy that day. Um, but no, well, that... you didn't try to, you should have been there trying to get some words from Stefan Everts afterwards. That was even more interesting. Uh, I'm get... Did it even happen? <clears throat> uh, was it that race or the later one where he um, ended up throwing his goggles on Mikel Pichon? That was and the was year before. That was Sun City the year before. Okay, well, I managed. I tried to. I had to wait outside the jury room where he was seeing the FIM, and eventually he got a ban, I think, or a suspended ban or a fine or something. And uh, trying to get a quote from Stefan Evitz that day was kind of interesting. Well, we we applaud you for your effort, and we wish for <laughs> more public relations people would try hard because. Well, Kunin uh, Kunin made a mess of it in the first moto anyway, right? Yeah, um, he washed the front on lap one was it i think it, yeah, yeah it was after the one. start um jammed his thumb which was weird because the body language i presumed it was a shoulder or a collarbone because he was really like favoring a shoulder um so i just presumed he was done uh jammed his thumb taped it up was fine in the second moto which makes me wonder should he have continued moto one like was that a inexperienced youngster overreacting when someone who's got a bit more time under their belt would be like right keep going um let's try out the thumb maybe it'll get better in two laps time and i can still get points i wonder if that was a mistake but who knows it may bite him down the line but but if you look at the crash the way he kind of lands maybe it's just from putting his hand out or getting it caught there and then it you know that kind of shot goes through your arm up into your collarbone and your shoulder doesn't it yeah that is actually a great point Maybe he suspected, yeah, maybe he suspected like a more serious injury. Um, but you said that maybe, you said that Kai will rival Simon. So where do you place Lucas? Uh, maybe difficult second album year. Uh, last year he had no pressure whatsoever, was the starlet, came through, had a very inconsistent bounce between injury and victory. You know, this year I think he's going to have some harder lessons because people like the Wolf, Lagenfelder, um, Benistan, um, Adama are all going to be a bit more experienced, maybe a little bit more stronger. I mean, Kunin, let's not forget, was he's still only 17 years old. Uh, I think he's going to run away with some Grand Prix, but then I don't think he's going to be the the master of the of the category as many people think. So you you are not even pegging him as a title contender this year. You believe it's I too think, early. No. I think he has more to learn. You know, I think he has more to learn. Okay, wow, that's caught me off guard uh, because I have been on record for some time as this will be a Lagenfelder Kunin title race. Uh, now, obviously, uh, Kaido Wolf has given me food for thought. Well, Adamo as well. You know, I don't think you can rule him out. Oh, don't make that face, Lewis. <laughs> I forget that we're on video now. I need to. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, we'll get we'll get there. Uh, I feel like we haven't given Kai enough. Respect. So just quickly, one more word on him. Uh, second Grand Prix win of his career. So that's a big deal. Um, and you know what? It took him so long to get the first. Sometimes getting the second can be even harder. So maybe this lights a fire. Maybe getting the second one starts a run. Um, and as I said, he was very patient. So if he can maintain that outlook and that mentality, who knows? This may be a Kaiser Wolf runaway. Because Simon Lagenfelder has an issue with second motos, which, <laughs> how is this for a stat? Um, and this is actually at the bottom of the YouTube video in our little breaking news bar, which you'll see later. Oh. Um, Simon Lagenfelder has won the last six first motos, dating back to oh, wow, last year. Okay. 
and has not followed that up with a second Moto win once. Didn't Prado have a similar stat to that last year? Yeah, I actually ignore, like, no, don't ignore me, but I worked that out last night, but didn't write it down. I believe that Prado has won 13, no, 14 of the last 20 first motos. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's starting a Grand Prix or, or a race day on the right foot, isn't it? I mean, then you're banking the 25 points already and then just looking to see what else you can gather. I don't really know how, with the qualifying race now carrying points, how that really sort of shapes up a strategy. I mean, obviously it's better to go 1-1 one, one any time, but, um, you know, it's uh, Lagenfeder, as long as he can sort of follow that one with a, a 2, 3, or 4, just like Prado did, then he's going to be in a great place. Yeah, that's a better question. Is this actually a problem for Lagenfelder? If you are on the team, are you identifying this problem and trying to fix it? Or are you like, if we can keep winning first motos and finishing third or fourth in the second moto, we'll be great. So just let's keep doing that. Yeah, technique and raw speed have never been his problem. But a little bit like Yago Gertz, uh, he had more lapses of concentration that just cost him valuable points and then inevitably he gets hurt. I, I, you know, this this should this should be the big. You were hyping him up last year, but I think this year is the big season for Lagenfelder. But then, you know, I still think you have people making their comebacks like Bernastan, and then you have the new kids as well. I mean, Zanchi and Marc Antoine Rossi both showed that they're quick as well. They're going to be in it. Yeah, no, I'm I'm high on Lagenfelder again. But I said this last year: the second motos is a problem. Get him out of Italy. Get him to Joel Smets. Get him in Belgium. It's so obvious. I don't know why no one's taken that step. Like, it's right in front of them. And you know what? Okay, maybe the second moto result was fine in Argentina. The fade wasn't. That was really, like, um, alarming. And speaking of getting him out of Italy, Marc Antoine Rossi, who's on a similar program, uh, my sources tell me that between motos, he was having water poured in on him. And, like laying down on the floor and um it was 22 degrees celsius which is like 70 fahrenheit um he's still a rookie i mean he he is he'll be another one who i'm not excusing it i mean i think you still need to be in shape but you know he's he's one that could really surprise a few people this year but then you know he might have the kunen or lagenfelder type season of two to three years ago yeah i just i'm still high on lagenfelder I just, I guess my frustration that I'm airing here is you you can go 1-1. One, one. Like, you can really just drive this home. This is your title. And if you're going to drop the ball in second motos, it's not going to be. Um, although this is just a yeah. very inconsistent class, so maybe he's not dropping the ball at all. I don't know. Maybe that, I care too much. It, it's that. I think you're going to see a big inconsistencies. That's why it could be a, you know... A curious championship and there are a couple of riders um evolving now into real kind of prospects you think well i'll be interested to see what they can do in a 450 in, in a year or two time but uh you know this I'm, I'm liking what i see in terms of the unpredictable nature of the class and then we should talk about the um the real big sort of news to come out of mx2 and that's the first podium for triumph which to be honest for me is no great surprise at all purely because the motorcycle is obviously capable and the reason is that the team behind it are so good and the people, the technicians behind the development of it, certainly in the MX2 class in Europe, um, mean means that it's gonna it was gonna be competitive. So, you know, full props to Mikhail Harrop because he's a good rider and um he evidently has the tools. And that second moto, the start, the first hole shot for for Triumph and then finishing second, it was good stuff. Yeah. Um were you surprised in the slightest? Because I wasn't. I was almost blase no. to it because yeah, Harrop's great. The team's great. The bike is obviously good. We knew that going in. Um, as bad as it sounds, Triumph um, is it's a compliment, but also kind of negative. Triumph is already just another manufacturer to me. Where okay. the results, I'm not really like surprised or shocked by any of the results, but that's a comment on how good they are. But maybe they, maybe I should still try and maintain some sort of intrigue and uh, um, amazement, which isn't a word. But no, I think it's... it's been generally accepted that most of the motorcycles in the gate these days these days are of incredibly high standard, and the difference just comes down to setup. 
And when you have people like Vincent Barini and the rest of his team, um, the former sort of Kawasaki racing team guiding that project, then there's no way that the bike is not going to be good if it's got a, a decent base. Uh, and then, you know, of course, it just comes down to the rider. I mean, Camden McClellan as well was ninth overall. So it wasn't as if you had uh, a really freaky result by Mikel Harrop and the other Triumph rider was nowhere. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential. And I, I don't want to be that surprised at all. But then also, I still think it's a novelty that the bike is there. And I think a lot of people will be looking for it. They'll be wanting to see it. They want to be wanting to hear it and, and watch how it goes. And um, I just think it's really cool that that new project came in and it didn't sink. It's, um, it's, it's making inroads. Can Harrop be a serious contender for this title? I am inclined to say yes. I would say no because he's he's never really been like a consistent podium guy, and you know to make that leap is the big thing, uh, regardless of the bike underneath him, whether it's a factory KTM or a Yamaha. Uh, you know, say for example, he's uh, Adamo's teammate this year. I mean, would you actually consider him as a title guy? I I guess not, but you say he's never been a consistent podium threat. To build on what we were saying about Lagenfelder, is that needed to be a title guy? Or do you just have to be a consistent top five guy? Well, yeah, I mean, we, we're contradicting ourselves because we just said there's going to be a lot of inconsistency in the class and in terms of results. I mean, Harrop, if he does get that consistency by being Mr. Top Five guy, then, uh, you know, then the job's going to be done. But this is a fantastic start and it's really cool. And it's, it's for the for the whole team to be able to take some, you know, some silverware away from that first Grand Prix. And uh, I, I just, I'm really fascinated to see how he goes across the first five Grand Prix. We have to peg a Grand Prix, Lewis, where we make a, a bit more of a meaningful stock of what's happened and what could happen. Yeah, what's a uh, Lugo, maybe? Yeah, second round in Spain. I'm hearing rumors there might even be a third Grand Prix in Spain this year. No, Lugo, Lugo, Lugo is uh, the second one. No, yeah, but yeah, I thought you meant. Sorry, one. I meant you. I thought you meant round two, the second Grand Prix in Spain, yeah. not the second Grand Prix in Spain. I don't know. There's uh, the rumors are. I mean, let me have a, I'm just bring in the calendar up here. Because, I think I believe the only TBA left is the last round. Yeah, round at the end of September. Well, I mean, if that's the third round in Spain, then what more proof do you need that success and a bit of a you know a rider with a decent profile can generate um, business interest or or attention around a sport? Are you talking about Ruben Fernandez? <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, well, it would have to be Talavera de la Reina, wouldn't it? No, it's supposed to be a new track from what I've heard. Well, not to break news, but Lewis may be going to the last GP with a friend. With a friend? Lewis may be bringing a friend to the last GP. So, like, what, Max Ancy's going to race in MHGP again? Lewis may be bringing a friend to the last GP. And it's not Ben Watson, because he'll already be there. Right. Watch this space. Chase Sexton? Watch Surely this not. space. Oh, wow. Okay. Big news. First, I, I have to make a friend. First, I have to make a friend. Actually, this is not news at all. This is I'm setting myself a personal goal of going to the last GP with a friend, and I've got a year to make one. <laughs> Well, um, somebody was talking, wasn't it you that was asking Phil Nicoletti if he wanted to race a, a Grand Prix? Uh, no, he and then absurdly, to. And then absurdly saying that he could probably get a result on Matterley Basin. Okay, maybe Lewis will turn up with multiple friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, no, but I thought it was meant to be Faenza. The last one, what, Andrea Davizioso's track? Yes. Oh, okay. And of course, Sorry. Mantova is just there waiting in the wings at all times. Yeah, why not have another race in Italy? We've already got two already, or three. Hmm. Well, stay tuned. Uh, Beniston was uh, in a similar vein to Renault. I feel like fourth overall almost was better than what Beniston was. Um, kind of anonymous. I still don't quite know where to place Beniston. He said he just wasn't feeling it, uh, wasn't 100% all weekend, wasn't comfortable. So for a guy who has been wildly inconsistent, to come out with a fourth overall is great. But looking bigger picture, I'm not exactly sold on what we're going to get from Beniston because I don't really know what it is that he brings to the table other than wild inconsistency and occasional wins. Yeah, he's he's a bit of a good all-rounder. You know, he has the, the flair and the technique of Lagenfelder. 
I think, you know, the stamina and the possibilities of, say, an, an Adamo. Um, but like you say, the injuries have just held him back and maybe just a bit of lack of character. Maybe that's what he needs to bring to, to boost his results this year. Um, so let's get into this Adamo debate. I would say, I hear that he's not exactly the happiest at the moment. I would say that round one was cause for concern. It was a notable dip from where he was last year, comparable to his competition. And I do not necessarily believe it was positive in any way, shape or form. Maybe that's a bit extreme, but you get where I'm going. Uh, what says you? Uh, I don't think there's cause for alarm yet. I think it's it's quite commonly known that he's still working towards an optimum setup with a 24 configuration. But top five, if you're not feeling great, is that's typical Adama, right? I mean, that's putting the points on the board and, and sort of looking ahead and working ahead. I mean, if he had finished 12th, I think we'd be saying, whoa, what's what's going on? But, you know, I, I don't think it's uh, such a big issue at the moment. Okay, that's a much more measured outlook. And now I seem just like <laughs> a dramatic princess. Um, no, it's a good question because he's the world champion and he didn't finish on the podium. So you'd be thinking, what's going on? But I still think top five, which was the best result for any KTM rider, by the way, in Argentina. Uh, you know, I don't think that's such a disaster. I think it's good damage limitation. And he was pretty fast on Saturday in the qualification heat. I mean, he was overhauled by the Husqvarna's right at the end. Um, I did think, wow, okay, here's, we, we got a bit more of a fiery Adamo like you were hinting in the preview show. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, if anything, that's why he was so good last year and that's why he'll be so good again this year is because he can assess and he can measure a situation and then not take any stupid risks. And that co we're saying MX2 is going to be wildly unpredictable, but the, the most predictable factor is that Adamo is going to be there working out what's going on and the points he can take. I said this last year but i have an issue now that the qualifying heats are points i have an issue remembering what happened in what moto but overall i just feel like results aside the fact that adamo was in a position to succeed in the qualifying heat did not seal the deal that alone is like for him personally would make him maybe go oh dear you know that might like doubt would set into him personally even if it doesn't for us that must be a bit of a concern and then potentially it spirals from there if he's that type of person yeah i don't so know some, he, uh, he's not um, my pick we're kind of sort of coming to the end of the argentine argentinian argentine grand prix roundup and um, i've got two more observations fair play to the guy on the inside of turn two who was barbecuing all day because from the TV feed, I kept getting distracted because there was this huge plume of smoke arcing across the track. And I was wondering which bike had blown up, uh, you know, what on earth was going on. But some guy basically cooking half a cow for the for the rest of the circuit attendance. So I hope he enjoyed his beer and um, his cookery. And then also I thought the TV um, coverage was not was pretty good. And you know, I love the drone. Predictable, yeah, very much the same. I mean, you could have gone back to 2019. I love the drone stuff, get more drone stuff in there. And also the contrast seemed to be a little bit way too up. I mean, it was hard sometimes even to make out the riders because it was so light dark. Um, there wasn't really that kind of depth in it. But, uh, you know, it's. Um, I, 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 I know you're going to shake your head now and get all despondent about the changes in MHGP. And this was something I said in the preview show. I said, I want to see something different this year and it wasn't delivered in Argentina. But... Maybe when we get back to Europe and there's a more stable or amplified TV crew or broadcasting set, then we could see one or two new things. Well, I just hope that we get our Kevin Bruman fix because <laughs> we've like we've now opened that can of worms. I got chapter one of Kevin Bruman. I want to follow this story. Imagine Paul if Kevin you're an Bruman. American fan and you're like, I'm going to give this MXGP thing a go. And then you're just like, who the hell is this guy? Like, what? Yeah, Where's he's this? one of the top... He's one of the top three Swiss riders in the world. Uh, no, I would I would say that Tonus is still better than him. Oh, goodness. Okay. <laughs> You're very um, prejudiced now. Um, we should talk about the press conference as well and the big news. Uh, yes, but quickly, uh, Marc-Antoine Rossi? Is he yes. not deserving of like major props? Uh, yeah, I mean, EMX 250 potential and pedigree. Uh, you know, it'll be quick. I mean, like I said, it'll be quick quick but maybe crashy uh, okay yeah that is exactly what happened in argentina but still for him to lead laps and you know like i felt as though that was uh 
could have been expected, but was still unexpected. Um, no, I was impressed. Another I feel like Frenchman. I Big feel shock. like because actually, if you look at it, uh, De Kooners are coming to America. Uh, De Wolf, Lagenfelder, Adamo, Everts, even maybe less so Everts, but they've been around in MX2 a little while. Marc Antoine Rossi is almost the next generation of MX2 for them. He's the first one of their new generation of MX2 riders. So it's promising for the Austrian group uh, for that reason alone. And then my only other point from MX2 was uh, Jack Chambers was actually really good. And I spoke to him the week before and he had very high expectations. And after Argentina, I believe that he's right to have high expectations. He um, is certainly capable of a top five at some point and maybe even a podium, which would be great for Steve Dixon. Yeah, Steve Dixon, I think, sent out a press release as well saying it's now 10 years in Kawasaki, uh, which I can't believe. I mean, it seems like an age he was wearing or he was running Yamahas and developing the latest stuff with Cosworth and whatever else. But yeah, wow, 10 years now with Kawasaki, not running Courtney Duncan anymore in, in the Women's World Motocross Championship and also um, running one of the very few Brits in the World Championship in Bobby Bruce. And um I don't know how you feel about Bruce, uh, but I, I think he's, you know, he's got sort of the bit between his teeth. He's got some potential, Lewis. And if he's got a fast enough Kawasaki that Dixon usually tends to make, then um, then watch out. Perhaps uh, the UK can actually have somebody that's um, fighting for a decent top 10s in MX2 again. Yeah, I had no opinion of Bobby Bruce before Argentina, but he clearly had the stuff. Um, so as he continues to build, this was his first race back from the wrist injury he had last year because Dixon didn't do any preseason races by design. Uh, Realised that the calendar is so long, why add more races to that? Um, yeah, I feel like Bobby Bruce can be good. Right, let's get on to the news. But before we do that, let me tell you about EVS Sports, the original protective gear company. EVS has been protecting champions and riders for almost 40 years and doesn't plan to stop anytime soon. What, start, what started out as one knee brace has evolved into a full line of protective gear to help keep riders safe while doing what they love. Check out evs-sports.com to see the same protective gear that pros RJ Hampshire, Kyle Chisholm, Axel Hodges and Travis Pastrana all wear every day. Um, so on Friday in Argentina, there was a press conference to open the season. It was announced that there will be an electric series in 2026 and beyond, um, a support class. As effectively, this is in front motor racing, hedging their bets, investing in the future of electric whilst not putting all of their chips in that direction. Um, my biggest question is what the hell will it be called? Because we've already got EMX and we've already got MXE. So they've really shot themselves <laughs> in the foot. They've used the best options on other series. So they've, yeah, terrible planning. And also people might be wondering how is it going to fit in when there's already so many sort of support classes in Grand Prix these days. But then remember that a lot of these uh, races don't take place at every single Grand Prix. Uh, EMX 350, I think, is the most prolific. They have eight rounds. But then, you know, there is space to maybe do another four or five round series and show off this electric stuff. And I think it's a great idea because the market is clearly pivoting towards that. There are more and more brands ex experimenting with this. We saw Trey Canard racing the Honda at the end, in Japan at the end of last year. You imagine that's also, even though it was like a prototype and showing off a concept, you'd have to imagine the next step for that is slightly more rigorous competition um, if they take it forward. And then, of course, we have the likes of Stark Future, you know, making the Varg, uh, which has been very highly rated, is now sort of um, being manufactured on a, a much bigger level. But then they issued quite a, actually, as we're recording this just a few hours ago, quite a, a stinging rebuke to the plans by the FIM. They feel that um, the Stark Varg is good enough to be able to in, be integrated against internal combustion engine motorcycles. And if the Varg has already won the British Arena Cross um, series, and, you know, maybe they have an argument. But uh, I just can't help but think, you know, why, what's wrong with being the best electric bike and then saying, listen, we have the performance, we have the data, let us race the other bikes. There's nothing wrong with, you know, um, taking that first step, even though they feel that it's um, kind of holding back innovation or whatever, you know, the march of technology by not being able to race against the, the factory bikes in MHGP. But again, you have to remember that the rule book of MHGP is designed 
So to contain costs to a degree, that's why we don't have a super advanced electronics. There's no over the air kind of upgrades or modifications. Um, you know, teams still have to wait until the bike comes back to the pits before they can plug in a laptop. Uh, you know, that, that stuff is, is made so that the racing doesn't get ridiculously expensive. And if you suddenly throw open the, the book, then, you know, you will see costs creep up and eventually that will have um, repercussions because brands and manufacturers will say, well, we've tried this for three years. It's not working. It's not selling as much as we want. We have to knock it on the head. Yeah, my personal opinion is I don't want electric bikes to be mixed in with the combustion engines because... Um, it just almost taints it a little bit because this is the combustion engine series. Let's have an electric series. That's great. Why do we need an un 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 why do we need an unorganized, chaotic setting where everyone's going against each other? No one really understands who has the advantage, whether anyone is at an unfair advantage. It just seems a bit like it would taint the sport almost. And my opinion on the press release from Stark this morning is this sounds bad. I my, I read it and I was like, that's almost a bit ungrateful because to an extent, in front moto racing are doing the electric series to cater to Stark, as well as HRC. Um, I would imagine those two would be the the most invested in it at this stage. Um, and there was almost no respect for in front taking the step. It was almost just like in front handed them a uh, an olive branch and the press release threw their dummy out the pram and said, no, we don't want it. We don't want that. That's like, I believe one of the quote, I haven't got it in front of me, but I believe one of the quotes in the press release was we strongly disagree with in front's decision. And it's like, well, okay, we we'll, we'll just won't have an electric series and you can continue to sit on the sidelines. Like you can't have it all your own way. There's obviously political agendas going on behind this as well. Uh, you know, motocross is supported by the manufacturers. And if the manufacturers are slightly wary of electric technology and how it might impact their own, you know, development and the results, then that's going to play a factor. And, you know, this is also partly guarded by the FIM. If the FIM have had, been having discussions with the likes of Stark Future and they're saying, you know, we will construct these technical guidelines that kind of introduce some parity, between the ICE bikes and also electric. And then they kind of yank back on it and say, well, actually, no, you know, you're going to have to do your own series. Then this may be one of the reasons why Stark have flared up and, and gone on the attack. But I just think in this situation uh, where you're trying to force change, of course, you're going to be a bit of a vanguard. You're going to have to be pushy with the establishment, but it, it just is maybe a bit too early. It's not like you have six or seven manufacturers suddenly that, you know, feel that their bikes are competitive enough to race against the, you know, the combustion engines. And it's just really stark alone, like waving the flag and being pushy. And it makes them seem, like you say, not ungrateful, but just um, uh, maybe not very diplomatic. And I, I just think, you know, it's a little bit short term. You know, you have to maybe think a bit longer and say, OK, we're going to take part in this. We're going to win it at a canter. We're going to show that our bike is the best electric bike and it could easily raise a 250 or a 450 or whatever push the FIM to change the rule book, which it can be done. I mean, there's some clever people working in and around the sport and the FIM. They can work out um, ratios, uh, power settings, whatever is needed to, to introduce some, you know, level playing field for MSGP. But um, I thought, I agree with you. It's a practice step for, for Infront to make this opportunity for a new technology. And it ticks a box politically and environmentally for the FIM. Uh, but, you know, I just think... Stark maybe should have is a little bit knee jerk. Yeah, like I agree with what you said. Race the electric series in 2026, and then using the data compiled, uh, being on the same track as the combustion engines. Release this press release then halfway through the season, saying we're overjoyed to be uh, attending MXGP events and to be leading the championship. The data shows us that we are competitive, and this is why we believe or hope that one day we can line up on the MXGP or MX2 starting gates. Also, I believe that... So, Stark were the first electric bike to really, you know, push for this, push for change, push for equality. Um, I almost feel like there's almost a bit of um, only child syndrome, because they aren't the only child anymore. HRC are right there with them, and you know what? HRC have been in MXGP, so... I would bet the HRC's opinion counts for a lot more because they are actually doing both. So I would bet the HRC have probably been consulted on this and said, we don't want 
our electric bike on track as our at the same time as our uh, 450 and 250 um and you don't see the same sort of as you said knee-jerk reaction from hrc like yeah it's it almost and again this is extreme dramatic it almost damages the brand somewhat because this stark electric um looks very nice bike almost futuristic and then you've got pr um angles like this that kind of make you go well are you here for the good of the sport or are you just here for to prove a point which ultimately that was the motivation behind their pr we just want to prove a point and we can't do that if we're put in our own little box yeah maybe they feel they're being bullied to an extent by the rest of the injury and of the, the industry and they have to push back uh you know i don't think you can fault a manufacturer especially a new one for being on the front foot but my my feeling is that you should perhaps try to fit into the stream rather than you know um, throwing a huge massive rock into it. Uh, maybe that's an easier way to go to get quickly where you want to go, which is showing that your motorcycle is awesome. That it's gonna you know people are gonna turn up from Sweden to Spain to France to Germany to Italy. They're gonna see this bike racing against other bike, probably winning because HRC you know uh, they're very conservative. The Japanese they're not gonna be suddenly filled in a factory team full of six electric bikes to compete. You know, Stark is going to be the main one, even though we're two years away from the championship. I mean, also electric bikes, you have the feeling it's more like an iPhone than a, than a you know, uh, a, a normal dirt bike where you'd say the, the course of evolution and development is getting smaller and smaller every year. I mean, we're now just down to real small characteristics of chassis construction rather than anything on the on the engine or electronics um maybe engine response is is one big thing you know manufacturers still want to look into but but electric bikes i mean the the potential to be longer and faster and more controllable is is arguably bigger so yeah just have a bit of patience um, um you know people will still be fascinated by the start fog and they'll still want to see it i just don't think you need to be suddenly pitched in against jeffrey hurlings and also potentially failing I'll tell you what this whole situation reminds me of. Um, WSX's PR stance to begin with. Bull in a yeah. China shop and look where it's got I agree. them. Yeah, completely. It, I think the motocross industry is, as we know, it, it's quite set in its ways and it's quite small, even though it's a big international pastime and, and uh, discipline. And, you know, the, these people that sort of, just come in all these companies and, and feel they sort of you know can push their own space they don't tend to sort of stick around too long so um i don't know just just an opinion from somebody who's been around for sort of 20 odd years and just an opinion from someone who's been around for like eight odd years <laughs> um um no uh, but speaking of hrc roger harvey heads up the electric program for hrc so um maybe i'll try to call him and get his take on Stark's stance and see where he lies. Because yeah, as I said, Stark are not the only child anymore. So if KTM and HRC are saying the opposite to Stark, what Stark have no uh, option but to com comply. So yeah, bizarre. Uh, bizarre. I honestly felt like when the announcement was made about the Electric Series, that it was almost a harmonious occasion where everyone can be happy, look at us, we're moving forward. And then when this PR came out, I was like, uh, I guess not. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. Uh, unexpected. A bit, a bit too knee-jerk, I think. Yes, I would agree. Um, right. Thank you, Adam Wheeler from the Paddock Pass podcast. Uh, when is the next Paddock Pass podcast? Uh, we recorded one today, actually, talking about the Qatar Grand Prix. So we got in just ahead of you. And sometimes last year, you've been a bit complaining that, you know, we were late with our MHGP podcast because I was traveling. And um, actually, this was your fault this time. That I, this don't, is a bit I don't believe that I ever complained once, Adam. That's... Okay. Well, you said, oh, yeah, Adam's been traveling. So we're doing this one a bit late. Oh, and people like, asked oh. me, people asked me where it was. And I told them the reason. That's not complaining. <laughs> um, no, um, just some general uh, housekeeping. I have had a lot of messages this week asking where this podcast was. It's late this week because we're trying this video. Um, potentially there won't be video if this hasn't worked, but fingers crossed. In future, I would say expect it around on tuesday late tuesday um but if it's not going to be late tuesday i will let you know on twitter or somewhere um so yeah you can expect it there it should now be on youtube every week kind of a bare bones version this week but what we've developed is in the future there will be a system where we will have graphs and animations so that 
I will prepare, for instance, Jeffrey Hurling's material so that when we're talking about Jeffrey Hurling's, I will press a button and then there will be Jeffrey Hurling's animations and graphs and stuff to make it a more visual experience. So stay tuned for that. Um, and thank you to Polysport, All Balls Racing Group and EVS, of course, for their support. Um, and I believe that's everything. Thank you, Adam. We will be back from round two of MXGP in two weeks' time. There's a weekend off because, as I said, a very long trip back from Patagonia, Argentina. So have a good uh, have a good uh, Seattle weekend. No, not Seattle. Where am I going this weekend? <laughs> Enjoy Indianapolis, <laughs> everyone. And then we will be back, uh, yeah, in not the not-too-distant future with another podcast. Thanks for listening. <laughs>